he's just a hack. He's just an absolute hack. And he gets his ass kicked by his teammates every week. It's just, you know, it's terrible. It's just terrible. Welcome back to another episode of the Believe in NFL Draft Prospects podcast. We are continuing on in the college football season. We're not at NFL draft season just yet, but we still have thoughts and things that are going on in the NFL draft world. I'm Joe Delio, and joined by NFL draft analyst Ryan Roberts at Rise and Draft on Twitter. Ryan, we're starting to really formulate our thoughts on a lot of these guys. And yeah. I feel like a lot of the thoughts that we had in the preseason still reside, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, like a lot of the guys that we were talking about at the beginning of the year, I feel like are still in that in that conversation. There hasn't really been anyone who's broken through, you know, the crust, if you will. No one's like really we've talked about some guys like Olu Fashanu was one yep. and we already knew Clark Phillips was good. So like him being one of our risers, we're going to talk about two other guys that maybe aren't necessarily first rounders, but mm-hmm. is it, is it weird to say that no one has really exploded and ascended to the point where they are suddenly and unexpectedly on a first round radar in the media side of things, just in general. I, yeah. I mean, that's a good question, actually. I haven't really thought about it too much, Joe. I mean, I, I feel like there's sequence to there's sequences to the draft process, right? Like right. there's usually the media driven stuff now, and then you get into the bowl season with early declarations that you're just kind of like, I didn't know too much about that guy, or get into the all-star circuit where guys pop off and then they mm-hmm. rise. I mean, like, was anybody talking about Cole Strange before no. the senior bowl, you know? And, and it, I mean, but even after he had a great game. At Chattanooga against Kentucky, people weren't talking about him a ton. Like, I mean, I think Jim Nagy tweeted some about him after he had that game. But I think that there are sequences to just how guys rise in this process. You know what I mean? So it's – Fashano's a good one, though. Olu is mm-hmm. a good one. But, I mean, yeah, to your point, most of the guys that we expected to be good football players – are the guys that are being good football players. So there's always going to be the Fashanus of the world, though. I mentioned Braylon Trice a couple weeks ago, who I think yep. is going to have a big rise in this class. Like there's always going to be some guys, but to your point, maybe not as not as many. I guess the uh the volume might be a little down to compared to some years. Right. It just my main point with the the opening thought there is it just it feels like the expectation is kind of just stuck where it's been. You know, and like we we talked about like how good we thought. Quentin Johnson was over the off season, but we recognized yeah. some of his issues. And, and even though he's dominating right now, there's recognition for that. My expectation, my thoughts on him now, my overreaction kind of came down to earth when you explain some of those things. It just feels like there hasn't, again, there's we're, we're like right at the same level of whatever expectations were. Maybe, maybe things yeah. change over the next couple of weeks, but the only main guy that keeps getting brought up is Hendon Hooker. I feel like, like that's the one guy who like everyone is now, making that debate but well, ryan i gotta say this before we we talk about um we yeah. do the read and then we talk about um the roquan smith trade i saw and i, I was just kind of poking around some articles and i won't say what outlet but max duggan's name was brought up as a riser uh would you care to comment on that you know it's funny joe i did a a petty kind of it was supposed to be like it was supposed to be a funny tweet from like 2021 mm-hmm. that someone just commented on the other day. And I, I said in the tweet that Max Duggan is my off the wall pick to be a riser in that draft. And obviously <laughs> that didn't happen. And uh, I guess people thought that it was a good take by me, but I was completely joking. I wasn't being serious with it. I, I, he's more talented than some guys we've been hyping up, man. I mean, yeah. like it, it's, it's, I mean like the Sam Hartman's of the world. Like why wouldn't I take him in that bucket over, a Sam Hartman or a Grayson McCall or something like that. Like there's a merit to it. I think, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to go like top hundred pick Max Duggan, but like day three developmental guy. Why not? You know, it's a dart throw at that point, but yeah, he's like, he's a really good athlete. Like that's where the, yeah. the, the value is, but then there's obvious limitations to his arm. Like his, he just, he's not really, He's not a natural thrower. He's like no. it. It's just very mechanical. He's like one of those guys. that's like a Josh Dobbs, Chris Stravella, yes. like one of those guys, right? Like they're big, strong, good-looking athletes, but and they have decently strong arms, but it's not a natural release, right? Like it just doesn't look like they're not a. It's just everything's very mechanical and yeah. robotic, and it's just weird. Yeah. The, yeah. the other thing too, if you watch TCU football games, and like again, I'm high on TCU this year. I love watching them play. But you got to understand the context of like a lot of his production. 
Yeah. And you watch it. It's a lot of wide open receivers. It's a lot of throws that are are taken to the house by Quentin Johnson and and some of those other really speedy guys. Like he is really helped by the circumstance mm-hmm. of all of those athletes. And I think you take him out of that situation and say you go put him on like Illinois or mm-hmm. heck mm-hmm. put him on Syracuse. Like I don't know if he's as productive. Like I don't know if he, if we're talking about him in the same the same light. It's a fair point. And I would say this, you know, it's we're always going to run into the air raid thing of how translatable it is to the next level because Sonny Dykes is an air raid guy, right? Like he came, he was like that Mike, Mike Leach tree mm-hmm. at one point, like he's that guy. So there's, there's merit to it. I've heard also heard people bring up Hendon hooker in that vein too. It's like, you know, that offense creates a lot of easy throws and it does. And that's why you need to decipher the easy versus the translatable versus the makeup that a player has. So I, mm-hmm. I think I do think though that Ma- I mean Max Duggan has done about as well as he could do this year, man. Like what a step that he's taken as a player. He wasn't even a starting. <laughs> I know. Well, that's why I hate when people use that as a scapegoat. I remember um, uh, who was the coach that just said, "Oh, it was uh, it was what's his name from Texas A and M. His name's escaped me. Jimbo. Jimbo Fisher was like yes." Do you remember when he started Haynes King to start the year and then he benched it for Max Johnson? I remember when Haynes had to start again because Johnson got hurt. Uh, Jimbo was like, oh, well, we're, you know, we're playing with a backup quarterback. And I'm like, Jimbo, he's your starting quarterback to <laughs> right, begin the year, right. buddy. Like, that's Take such a, a lane, bad excuse. Jim. <laughs> that's such a bad excuse, man. Uh, just because you're just because you're like three and four or whatever you are with one of the best recruiting classes ever that doesn't give you a – doesn't give me an excuse for this right now, man. Doesn't give an excuse. I won't take us down the rabbit hole, but that why the Connor Weigman kid is is fun. Like that, no, that he's, kid he, has some he's well, and but then Joe, you can also poke holes in the coach, and though it's like, why was Connor Wegman not starting earlier in this season? Like yeah, the, you know, after after you had Max, of, yeah. a, if, after Max Johnson gets hurt, after you've already said, nope, Haynes King's not the guy, and you go to Max Johnson, why isn't Connor Wegman in the conversation after Max Johnson gets hurt? Like, just a lot of weird things, man. A lot of weird things. A lot of messiness, and speaking of messiness, we're going to talk about the Chicago Bears. Before we get to that, though, uh, I want to tell you folks about Bet Online. We've got the NFL surging on, college football surging on. We also have got the NBA, NHL seasons that started. You can also be betting on the World Series. And if you're going to be doing that, make sure you head on over to Bet Online, where you'll find all the latest odds, matchup info, player news, and game trends as uh, your continued source for all of your sports wagering info. Bet Online features live betting, free contests, live scores, and giveaways all season long. Head to betonline.ag and join and receive your 100% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure you use promo code BELIEVE to receive your rewards. Bet online where the game starts. All right, so we had a trade go down that was pretty significant. Now, I know that there were a lot of trades that have been happening over the past few days, and once the trade deadline hits, there's going to be even more significance. Um, but I think that this Roquan Smith trade by the Chicago Bears is probably going to be the largest one in terms of capital. I, I, I mm-hmm. doubt that someone massive gets moved for a first-round pick, but Roquan Smith is heading to the Baltimore Ravens, uh, and they are currently in ownership of a first-round pick, two second-round picks, and uh, two fifth-round picks, along with two fourths, a third, and a seventh. So they are pretty stacked up for this upcoming draft class. Wouldn't be surprised if they didn't try to add some more draft picks. Now, Ryan, I just want to talk from like an overall team-building perspective as a draft show that's the yep. angle that we're always going to take. This is going to be probably the biggest rebuild in the NFL, separate from the Carolina Panthers. Like, wh- what does this really do for them? Like, you get rid of a young linebacker in Roquan who doesn't want to be there. Like, what? Right. What do you? What do they try to attack? Like, that's what, to me is like what needs to be fixed on this team because this is it's a mess. Well, I mean, I think if we start with the trade, Joe, I actually think it was a good move by the Chicago Bears. I mean, it, yeah. in a vacuum you're trading one of the best linebackers in the NFL. Like there's no doubt about it, but Roquan Smith's not signed after this year. So he's going to be due for a massive contract. So if there's any time to trade him, I think it's now because look, look, I'm a big linebacker guy, right? Like I played the position. I value it still heavily, but the fact of the matter is, is that Roquan wants to get paid. Like he wants to get paid. So I don't think that where you, with what your roster is right now with you, with the bears, 
I don't think you have a window that would make sense to pay an off-ball linebacker $20 million a year. Like, I just don't think that makes sense, right? So getting a second and fifth, I think, is pretty good value for what Roquan is. You know, he's a good football player, no doubt about it. But you're a Chicago Bears team that has a lot of uncertainty. And right now, you need to build the right way, in my opinion, right? Like, I would ask you, Joe, like, who are the pillars on this Bears team right now? I mean... Maybe Justin, Justin Fields. Fields. Maybe. Maybe. I, I mean, I, I it's I think it's still yeah. – the jury is still out in that situation. I'm saying, like, who are the pillars that you know for certain are pillars? You know what I mean? Like, I push back slightly on that on Justin Fields uh-huh. because, like, I – having been, like, a Giants fan and watching Daniel Jones every <laughs> single week and, yep. like, people – the way that people talked about him after his second year – Justin Fields is in his second season and there's a lot of nice things that are flashing and considering the circumstance, there's nothing around him. So like, yeah, I would consider him to be a pillar trying to reset at quarterback is just going to offset you at the very least. You've got a really good athlete at quarterback. Maybe you put some weapons around him and you build up that offensive line. He's going to do a lot better, but to your point, you don't know for sure because he hasn't shown enough certainty in his performances, but -hmm. right now that roster is a mess. Justin Fields is, I think the only level of certainty. And I like, Maybe like Khalil Herbert's nice, but he's not a pillar. He's just a piece on that that roster. I mean, I, I do like Khalil Herbert. I mean, if you ask me who the pillars were, I would say Herbert might be one. Like if I was the Bears, if they're tra- trading Robert Quinn and now making this trade with Roquan Smith, I would try to have David Montgomery on the move. You know, because again, yeah. he's going to be up for contract in a couple of years, and I just I don't I don't think that he is the type of back that you want to give a second contract to, right? So. Khalil Herbert on a rookie deal that was like a six-round pick. That's not a bad spot to be in. You have him, and hopefully Tevin Jenkins is one of your pillars. I mean, I know he's been banged up a little bit. I think he's playing okay this season. Darnell Mooney, you need to start getting it, you know, kind of in back on the right track type of thing. He maybe could be a pillar. Outside of that, I mean, defensively, you have the rookie safety, Jaquan Brisker, I think is a really good player. Yes, Kyler, yes Kyler. I forgot about him. Yeah, Kyler Gordon's playing, you know, up and down, but he was a second round pick last year. He should probably be thought of as a potential pillar, hopefully. But I mean, to your point, this roster right now is and Kill Harry caught a touchdown last week, Joe. I mean, like, <laughs> let's, let's freeze it like uh, that, right? Right now, your starting receivers are Darnell Mooney, who's not playing great football, not all his fault. Dante Pettis, who you know played for the Giants at one point, mm-hmm. and Equinemius St. Brown. Just starting receivers, man. Backups to them. Velas Jones, who has done nothing this year, no. drafted by Tennessee. I mentioned in Kill Harry, and then Isaiah Coulter apparently is on the Bears, Joe. Uh, I don't know yes, if you knew he that is. One. He has not. So. No, I did know that. I did know that Zay was on the Bears, but I don't. They panned over to him on the sideline, not dressed, talking to someone. So I don't know if he's. He was always somebody who had a lot of injuries, but um, I, yeah, the, I think there's a lot of different ways that you can, you know butcher this pig here where you can fix this team like there's so many different ways that you can fix this and i guess it's a good problem to have like no overanalyzation just draft best best available that first round pick to me has to go to an offensive lineman like they can't and i know that we try not to emphasize the like oh you know reach because indeed Mm -hmm. you can't continue to watch justin fields fight for his life but it helps them the one thing i will say that that second second round pick this isn't a great receiver class, but there's going to be some pieces in the second round. Like that's a really good yeah. opportunity for them to get maybe one or two guys, just some weapons. Like they need to start offensively because that's where the best possible pillar, at least the foundation is Justin Fields. Don't go defensive. Like I feel like if you're like constantly like leaning defense, trying to fix this bears team, mm-hmm. it, it, that's what this problem has been for so long. Ryan is that mm-hmm. we've just watched a defensive team with no offensive prowess slop around every single season. I know that's like, well, Again, you don't want to reach to to fill need and 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 stick to a certain philosophy like we talked about on the show, but yeah. maybe they need to change a pace here. Maybe it needs to be an offensive approach. What the weirdest hire this offseason from a head coaching perspective, aside from what, what's the guy's name that's in Denver now was the offensive Hackett. coordinator for the yeah Nathaniel Hackett, which is just yeah. an awful hire. And it was an awful hire then, and we talked about it then. That was an awful hire. But draft, but giving the job to Matt Eberflus, who was a defensive coach at the with the Indianapolis Colts as the head coach for the Bears, just thought that was a weird move, man. Like you had a young quarterback that you need to kind of figure things out. 
there, there's not a bunch of Sean McVay's walking around, but I feel like you needed that type of guy, you know, like to come and kind of save the development of a Justin Fields. So mm-hmm. hopefully Matt Eberflus is better than what I think he is, and he can kind of get the offensive structure worked out. But, I mean, for me, Joe, like you mentioned the two biggest needs, and I think if you come out of the draft with an offensive lineman early, because they need a right tackle, man, they do. Like Larry right, but- Borum. Larry Borm's not a tackle. Braxton Jones actually playing decent ball at left tackle as a rookie, which is a nice find in the fifth round. That's awesome. Tevin Jenkins develops and becomes the player that we thought he could be coming out of Oklahoma State. Then you're getting better, but right tackle's an issue. You need to get that. And then, man, wouldn't it be nice if they can get Jackson Smith and Jigba to uh, to reunite with Justin Fields? Obviously, he had a lot of a lot of success with him in it during his Ohio State career and. That would be kind of the instant separator that I think they need in this offense. But I could not agree more that it is offensive tackle or offensive line, I guess, just in general, and it is wide receiver. Those are the paramount positions to figure out. And, I mean, yeah, weapons, 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 and protection. That's what you need for Justin Fields right now. And can't go wrong with that approach, building up the offensive line, getting some receivers. So, Ryan, we've got our next thing that I wanted to get to has uh, a little bit of a connection to your trip this past weekend. So Garrett Williams suffers an ACL injury and he is going to be done for the rest of the season. I'm unsure of his exact eligibility off the top of my head. He's a a, so he would be a technically he would be a he would be younger, fourth, right? He's a fourth year player, but I think he's technically a sophomore with the COVID year. That's so. that's what I thought. So yeah. he's somebody, it seems like probably going to come back. I don't know for mm-hmm. sure what that deal is, but this sucks because I think a lot of people had him as a top 50 pick. And we talked about yeah. him during the preseason as a top 50 pick, a top corner selection. And now this corner group is seemingly thinning out that there is no Garrett Williams from Syracuse in that discussion. He's a good football player, man. He really is. I mean, I, I feel like most media members have rated him probably around the top 50, and I think that he was a very safe second-round type of player. Like I, uh, Joe, we talked about in the summer, right? Like He is just a really refined kid, good athlete, just understands how to play a position, man. Like I talked to a, a scout for the Denver Broncos about him briefly, and he was just lauding over his – football IQ and his spatial awareness and all that great stuff. Right. And obviously that was before the game before he got injured. So it, it's very unfortunate, man. He's also a friend of the show and he's a good kid. I actually checked in with him last week leading up to the game to let him know I was coming down to the game, you know, and then I just texted him before we got on the show, just, you know, making sure he's doing okay. Cause it's mm-hmm. a, it's tough, man. Like, cause he, he flirted with entering last year's draft. Like he almost entered 2022 as a 30 or sophomore and then decided to come back because I guess he just didn't get quite the grade that he wanted to from the advisory board. But now you come back, and I thought he was having a, a good season, a much healthier season than last year, and unfortunately gets banged up with the ACL, which just sucks. I mean, it really does suck. But he's a good football player. Whether he ends up declaring for 2023 still or he goes back to school, I'm not sure what the decision is going to be. But I think that someone's going to get a tremendous value, especially if he comes out, because he's probably going to go lower than he should. And, I mean, ACL tears at the end of the day aren't that big of a deal anymore. Like, they're not. So, it's it's going to be they're, interesting. They're not. But, like, one of the things and somebody – I was talking about, like, Saquon's ACL with somebody when he started to have a really good start to the season. And, and it kind of put in a really good perspective that the recovery process is a lot quicker. But it's usually the second season back from that injury is when you're kind of back to normal. And you're, you're back to the way that you were. Because there's always just going to be natural – hesitation mentally there's going to be limitations some slight limitations physically there's just a lot of factors that come into it so it hopefully it doesn't hurt him you know hopefully it doesn't take him out and take a step back because he's a fantastic athlete he's a great great defensive back it just it sucks and again there's less good corners that are now in this class yeah i mean it's getting really thin man because i mean we talked about it what was it last week or two weeks ago the last time we recorded and I mean, right now, I mean, I'm a huge Clark Phillips guy. We've talked about this out of Utah. But after that, man, you're like, you know, Kaylee Ringo, has he taken the step forward? You know, I need to see mm-hmm. what the Phillips have been looking like so far this year. Joey Porter Jr. is a guy that everyone's fallen in love with a little bit. Again, uh, just going to kind of tread on that one for a little bit and take a deeper look. Cam Smith, Caillou Blue Kelly, Emmanuel Force, like no one's really ascended near the top of this class. Like it's probably – I think it's just stayed pretty steady. I Like I, I like the class – 
in the summer as far as having some depth, but there wasn't any guys at the top that you were like slam dunk. Like Kaylee Ringo could be that guy, but he isn't right now. And I think that that's the, the struggle that you're finding right now is that you just got a little thinner at the top and the top was already not, not solidified and wasn't star studded. And so this is just a, a knock obviously, because again, Garrett's only 21 years old, three-year starter at Syracuse. Last time that we saw him in a really talented secondary with Ifiatu Melifonwu and Andre Sisko and Trill Williams, he was the best defensive back they had as a tr- as a redshirt freshman. So hopefully he gets back soon. But, I mean, you're absolutely correct, Joe. This is a big, big um, knock on this class because you're still trying to figure out what the pecking order is of the quarterback group in 2023. So you were at this game, though, and you got to see yeah. – uh, some Notre Dame guys in person, and yep. you got to see some Syracuse guys in person. I want to start talk, and we'll probably we'll we'll wrap with this this perspective on these guys and getting to see them because there's yep. a lot of really good players that played in this game. Like there's a mm-hmm. lot of legit NFL players just off the top of my head. Like uh, Michael Mayer is just one of them. And then we got on the Syracuse side of the ball, you got to see Matt Bergeron and Sean Tucker. Now Sean Tucker was not pleased with his performance, but how do you think that he uh, he looked out there and as well as Bergeron? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that for me, Tucker did pretty much everything he could with what he was given in that football game. I mean, you probably watched it too, Joe. It was like yeah. the only big run he had on the day was him you know, completely bending his zone back and working outside because there just was not much room. And the Notre Dame defensive line and linebackers really played a good football game. But So it was more downhill type running for Sean Tucker. He just kind of had to take what was given to him. But I thought you saw the instances of – hey, when he gets out in space, he's got a little bit of juice to him. He's got pretty good vision as a zone runner. Just wasn't a lot of opportunities in this football game. And they even tried to sneak him on a couple wheels down the field where it was actually Isaiah Foskey covered him stride for stride, which was pretty wild at 6'5", 265 pounds. But to your question about Tucker, man. Is there a clip of that? Is there a clip of that? I can 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 find a clip. Yeah, I got the old 22 on it, so I could uh, Um, could find a clip on that, man. It was wild. Do you know what quarter that was in? I might pull it up while you're talking. I believe it was third quarter, most likely. I believe it was the third quarter. Okay, I'll pull it up later. It was was literally – Joe was literally back to back plays, man. They ran the same wow. play, like wheel route, and they got him matched up against Foskey. And Foskey ran stride for stride. It was, dude, it was talk about bananas. a size mis- mis- mismatch there. Yeah. <laughs> you're talking about you're talking about five ten two ten versus six five two sixty. Like it was bizarre, man. I was just like, wow, that's eye popping. Because Isaiah Foskey has been a very up and down football player for Notre Dame this year. But then you see stuff like that, you're like. Freaky stuff, man. Freaky, mm. but uh, so I thought. I thought that Tucker did good with what he had. It wasn't anything spectacular. Bergeron, I didn't really check much out on. I mean, I'll tell you this: I saw him warming up before the game, and I was like, "Oh, my guy looks the part. Like he is all of six foot seven and three quarters and thirty four inch arms, and it all checks out." So I think they both had solid showings in this one against Notre Dame. Now, for the Notre Dame guys, um, we were texting a little bit about Brandon Joseph, who had a really, really nice day in this game. There's actually a possibility that he's not really a part of this class. And I think that the more that we were talking about it because of his eligibility, it might be more beneficial for him to stay back another year because he's just one of those kids that's super raw. Like he, He's got all the traits, but he just hasn't really actualized it yet. And I think he's not necessarily there, there, to his full potential in his first year at Notre Dame. It really might benefit him to, to go back. It's been a roller coaster for him, Joe, because if you remember against Ohio State, he played really well. He looked fantastic in that football game. And then he actually missed a game. I think it was either U- the UNLV game or he missed the Stanford game. And I, I think that kind of the story is, is that he was banged up you know, throughout a little bit of the early portion of the season until now. And you saw him warming up against – against Syracuse and I mean he is he is the life that that Notre Dame needs man like he's got so much energy he's a springy athlete first play of the game he jumps a slant pick six which is fantastic to see but the more impressive play in my opinion was in the fourth quarter he had this rangy interception working over top that was there was this phantom offsides call that uh, I still haven't seen it on film but it was just a rangy play working from center field he showed 
the quickness he had. And then in the run game, man, there was one play where he stuck Sean Tucker in the hole, dude, like stuck. <laughs> And I'm like, oh boy! And it, and he put that that video that um, picture on Twitter, which is fantastic. Clowning on so Tucker disrespect. <laughs> what like was Sean Tucker talking shit to him? That just seems so unnecessary that he just took that. I, it was hilarious, but it was just a little bit unnecessary that he took that shot. <laughs> I, I would say this: I don't know if Sean Tucker's a, a trash talker, but I do know that Brandon Joseph is a t- trash talker. So. Did it happen during the game? He, he's probably drawing with a bunch of guys. But Man. it's going to be interesting, though, Joe, because Notre Dame plays Clemson this week. And then they have a couple easy games, Navy, Boston College. But then they end against USC. So to your point about is Brandon Joseph going to declare, It's I think it's going to depend a lot about what he looks like down the stretch because the scouts are going to go to the Clemson game. They're right. They're going to go to the USC game to see what his impact is, especially against the pass against USC. So right now, I would say as we are standing right this second, I would advise Brandon Joseph to go back to school. But if he Mm -hmm. lights it up down the stretch, who knows? Right. Like he it only matters what you did your last snap. It only matters what you did down the stretch of a season. Those are the games that scouts are going to watch. And if he show if he if he comes the ball out against Clemson and USC, Still possibly declares, but it's a kind of a wait and see for me right now. And not shockingly, you were salivating over Michael Mayer and you were tweeting about him a little bit today or was yesterday. I forget when you Joe, were tweeting about him. Joe, it's it's insane, man. I, I so I'm on the the th- there's a live chat thread on Irish Breakdown on the message uh-huh. board. And literally, man, he made that catch near the end of the first half, which was like a 35 yarder or whatever, which if Drew Pine throws it earlier, it might be a touchdown. Like, it's possible, right? Like, he just cooked the, the defensive back that was in coverage. I have no idea why Syracuse, less than a minute left, is like, we're going to play man-to-man against Michael Mayer. That's going to work out really well, and it was dumb. <laughs> it was really stupid. But I, I literally wrote in the, in the thread after that happened, I'm just like, I think we all, as Notre Dame fans, need to take a step back and truly appreciate – who Michael Mayer is, man, because, I mean, Joe, it's easy to kind of overlook it because he's still an active football player. But Notre Dame fans and just national media and uh, national fans in general, we're watching one of the best tight ends to play at Notre Dame in history. Like, this is a this is a crazy to say. It's a le- he's going to be a legend. Like, you're going to talk about Michael Mayer at Notre Dame for the next 50 years. You are. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, tight end you and you've had guys like, Dave Casper and Mark Bavaro and Tyler Reifer and John Carlson and Anthony Fasano and all these great tight ends. And Michael Mayer has a legitimate argument as the best tight end to ever put on the blue and gold. Like he has yeah. a legitimate conversation for that, right? So there's some people that I've seen on Twitter, you know, the scouting world that are questioning his athleticism and all this type of stuff. And I'm just like, guys, this dude is I one, he's super flexible, and I, I can't believe how big he is. He's 265 pounds, and he can run routes as, as good as any tight end you'll see coming out over the next you know few years or in the past couple years. Runs great routes, big guy, strong, physical after the catch, and a good straight-line athlete. Like Everything just checks out, man. The kid is going to be so good on the next level, and he's a legend. Like He is one of the best tight ends that we have seen in recent history. He is He's that good. And I just think that people need to appreciate him a little more because it's not, he's not a sexy player, right? Like he's not a Kyle Pitts, but this is, I feel like on the next level, he's just going to be like Jason Witten. That's just good for like the next 10 yeah. to 15 years. And it's not flashy, but he's, wow, wow, oh, Michael Bear had a thousand yards like three times. It's crazy. Like, didn't even notice that, right? Like, that's, that's who Michael Mayer is to me. That's underappreciated, but just dominant football player. Yeah. And for some reason, there's some people that are, trying to knock him in this draft cycle and i pray for those people because they clearly don't want to acknowledge the talent that he brings to the table he's he's fantastic he's just he's he's different he's not the springy or not springs he's not like a 4-4 athlete and i think that's why a lot of people don't want to buy into him but uh once you realize who he is and that he's a tank he's a bowling ball to an extent (laughs) just running everything over uh, then you could truly appreciate Michael Mayer. Right. I think that's a good note to wrap us up on at Joe DeLeon at Rise and Draft. Be sure to hit that subscribe button. We'll be back with more. We'll talk to you folks later.